everybody is. This is Andy Huntington, who is an interaction designer, an artist and product developer, uh, making playful products for galleries and museums and studios, amongst other places. Um, at, the, at the end, we've got James Boardwell, who's director of a company called Rattle, uh, which makes products and services using data and the internet in interesting ways. Uh, he's also founder of the, one of the UK's largest handmade marketplaces, which is called Folksy. Uh, and in the middle, we've got Michael Eden, who is a ceramicist, and he uses digital technology um, in the production of his ceramics. So that's the panel, and um, I think James is going to be first up to talk through his images very briefly. Mm. We're just going to do a very brief uh, look at images just to set the scene and, and kind of put you in the landscape that we're talking about. Then we'll have around about 20, 30 minutes chat amongst the panel, um, and then we'll take questions and answers at the end. However, if anybody would like to um, tweet any questions as we go along, if you want to tweet those two, at Sallyent, S-A-L-L-Y-E-N-T, I'll try and pick up a few of those and feed them in as we go along, but there'll be questions and answers at the end as well. Okay, thanks. Cool. Come on, tech support. <laughs> JPEGs would be easy. Just while we're waiting, does, it, does anyone actually ha kind of have an idea of what postcraft might, might mean? Good. Good. <laughs> we, we, we have no idea either. No. You ready? Cool. Um, okay, so I'm James, and I was just going to mention a few things, uh, mainly drawn from my experience of kind of running folks, which Sally mentioned, which is a marketplace for handmade stuff where you can buy stuff like that. Meerkats. Um, woolen meerkats, fantastic things. Um, but my primary kind of interest in kind of doing folks and other things is, is kind of this idea of kind of a distributed cottage industry, the, the economics and the behaviours around kind of taking some of the things which, which were pre-industrial pre and applying them to the post-industrial kind of web-orientated world we live in. Um, so the, the first thing which I'm really interested in in, uh, and, and kind of seeing through folks here and other things is how you can quite quickly develop kind of what, what's, um, what's been termed kind of as local global brands. So people, micro businesses, uh, selling things but selling it globally and getting, getting well known for that. And doing that through, often through when it's handmade and craft based, through the provenance of the item, so through storytelling the, the, how the items come into being and what have you. And we're looking at ways of developing better ways to tell stories through data, particularly. So like metadata around when a, when a product was created, what the stimulus for that product was or inspiration was, um, what you're perhaps listening to or reading at the time, that kind of thing. Um, to kind of enable those stories to, to come out in, in other ways than they currently do. It's also kind of a problem because people aren't naturally necessarily very good at storytelling. Um, the second thing is protecting IP. We get a lot of things that are copied. You get a lot of, um, I don't know if you can see that, but that's kind of a, it's a knitted, and, uh, yeah, a knitted cake. Lots of knitted cakes. Um, um, and actually people get very vexed when people see their knitted cake um, being, you know, being, uh, I guess, similar knitted cakes appearing uh, on, on folks, as, as, as you would. Um, and Protecting IP, protecting the kind of sense of, um, of what is yours, I think is incredibly um, difficult in what is this cottage industry in the web when people can, can share things very easily, they can share the, the, the way in which something was created. Um, and IP is, is a very anomalous kind of thing. And finally, um, kind of innovating is really hard. Um, in my other kind of role at Rattle, we kind of we built something called a job box, which you, if you look for online, you'll, you'll see. Um, and we found that kind of quite tricky because it was a move into hardware and moving to kind of creating creating something which blended software and hardware in, in new ways and what we found is the similar things with with folks is that uh, people making stuff um, are very very reticent to go outside of their comfort zone their practice their craft um, or work with someone else who's um, who's perhaps very good at something else so jewelers don't tend to work with knitters um, software engineers don't tend to work with um, you know people who work with felt for instance um, 
So innovating is quite hard, which is perhaps why you tend to get quite a lot of those. Maybe that's me. That's that's that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Michael. If you'd like to, to have a go next. Thank you. Hello there. Um, as Sally said, um, I'm Michael Eden, and I, I make things. So I'm very much coming from that perspective. Um, I spent quite a bit of time thinking about an image, an appropriate image to show today. And I wanted to show something that expresses my belief that the desire to make things is hardwired into the human psyche. I could have chosen an example of a, a beautifully crafted sort of wizardry or something controversial like an image of the 3D printing of human organs, uh, something after all which uh, involves extraordinary levels of craft skills. However, I wanted to show something that also ties in with one of the main themes of, of this year's Future Everything. Um, so I chose this. It's called a Rebelib. It's handmade. It's simply constructed, it's strong, and it's practical. And it's also an expression of a community working together to share information. It's actually data visualization in its purest form. The horizontal and vertical sticks um, act as a frame, whilst the diagonal and curved ones represent uh, ocean currents, wave swells, and the relative position of a group of islands uh, to the northeast of Papua New Guinea in the, in the Pacific Ocean. It's made of coconut fiber and cowrie shells, and it was constructed about 100 years ago to determine a system of piloting and navigation. It's Marshall Island Satnav, and for me it represents the spirit of invention and creativity that will express itself regardless of what tools or materials are available to the maker. Thank you. And thirdly, Andy Huntington. <clears throat> um, hello, yes, um, my name is Andy. I work independently, but also um, for a studio called Berg, doing product development work. And my background is in music originally, which is possibly the most rarefied form of craft, having almost no artifacts whatsoever. Um, but you do get artifacts occasionally coming out of incredible design studios, if we can call them that, in the 1650s. Not just creating amazing objects, but entirely new ways of playing music. Um, Sinatra Cembalo, you should look it up, it's terrifying. I make toys as well. Um, I moved through working uh, with software, which is essentially free to use, um, into making things which are not free. They're hard work and expensive, which is annoying. Um, so these are some music toys that I made. Um, some of the processes by which um, people would associate digital craft, perhaps. A lot of CNC, PCBs, tooling, um, all for entertainment. More toys, again. Also taking data, putting them through various processes to try and create something that could be productized. I'm really interested in this area of craft versus scale. How do you actually communicate what you do to a larger number of people outside of just doing exhibitions, um, outside of creating purely cultural artifacts, rarefied cultural artifacts? How do you make products not easy coming from software? And these are a set of decorations that I made with um, a couple of guys called Russell Davis and Ben Terrett. They're essentially social network data turned into laser cut and 3D printed snowmen telling you how many Twitter followers, followers you have. It's that kind of area that we have to play with at the moment because it doesn't matter if your Christmas decorations look a bit rubbish or perhaps cost quite a lot of money or maybe can only be given to a few people at a time because it's too expensive to make these. It's annoying but a bit of fun. The tools are there now. But it's still very early days. We're very much in the geocities of things, not the internet of things at the moment. And that's where I shall leave it. Thank you very much. Mm. Just be, before we start the... Sorry. Oh, sorry. Before we start the, uh, the, the kind of panel discussion, I just wanted to give you people's Twitter details and websites in case you want to have a look at, at any of more, more of that in detail. So, Andy's on Twitter is Andy underscore Huntington. 
Uh, James, you can find at Rattle Central. Uh, I'm Sally ENT. Michael hasn't joined the world of Twitter yet. Maybe we'll convert you. Uh, he's michael-eden.com. So you can have a look at more of that in detail I'm, there. I'm not, I'm not Rattle Central. I'm James B. Are you, you're both. Do you want both? I'm just James B. You're just James B? <laughs> yeah. OK, James is James B. Yeah. You're Rattle as well. Um, OK, so... Um, we were sent the copy for this, uh, this event and we looked at it with interest and I was a bit scared because I didn't know what Postcraft was. Um, I thought maybe we should start with asking, um, what is Postcraft? Does it exist? Does it mean anything? What do we understand it to be? So uh, maybe, James, shall we start at oh. your end? <laughs> um, I, I, well, I was thinking, I've been thinking about this for the last couple of days and I, my, my feeling is that... Um, where I guess for me, if it, I, a, I don't think it exists at all, actually. Um, but I need to say something. So my belief is that where where you get, um, I guess, different crafts coming together and using, um, kind of, I guess, using technologies in interesting ways, could could be seen to be moving on from traditional craft kind of practices. Um, I'm not particularly sure about that. Um, but I guess some of the work that Michael's been doing. Could possibly be seen as kind of moving, moving beyond kind of traditional craft stuff. I don't know. Oh um, no, I don't. I, I don't think it does actually. I don't think I. I don't think I'm moving on from traditional craft. I'm just using different tools, and they involve learning new skills and building up the tacit knowledge that I gained as a potter for twenty odd years, and the sort of understanding of the three dimensional form. It's just a matter of trying to transfer some of those skills into a new set of tools. You know, if I want to make a a cup and saucer. I'm, I'm not going to go to a selective laser sintering machine. I'm going to go. I'm going to open a bag of clay and go on the wheel. So, for me, it's about um, appropriate use of tools. So, for me, you know, post craft is bollocks, um, <laughs> <laughs> in a word. <laughs> um, and, and the other the other controversial um, uh, phrase in, in the in the blurb yeah. we were sent was uh, post digital. Yeah. As well, I think. What's that? You know, if this, you know, if this is a, a new industrial revolution, then we are at the equivalent of the year 1800 in terms of the first industrial revolution. We, you know, we are so sort of not not even not even on the first rung of the ladder. It seems to me. I don't know whether. Anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I think there's there's a certain amount of. Um, I, I, I'm thoroughly sceptical about the terms post-craft and, to some extent, post-digital as well. Um, but I think there's a certain amount of anticipation in people that they've seen how the, the internet has developed and there are arguments for and against how, um, how democratising that has been. And there's this almost anticipation that the, the tools, the machines are there now to enable people to um, create not just software um, but also hardware to make the tools, the artifacts that they want to um, share their world and their existence with right there. You, can, you could print your own light fittings. There are some people who do that, which seems a bit odd. There's a, but there's, people are seeing, wondering if the, if the tools are going to match and the, ex, and the explosion that we saw with the internet is going to be matched in hardware terms, and I'm not sure it will. <coughs> OK, uh, there's something I maybe could pick up on and, and throw open again there is um, I wonder whether those digital technologies and the, the resources that are available through the internet, does that make it more viable to be a professional maker? Does it affect productivity? Does it change the market? Does the internet and digital technology make it easier to, to earn a living from being a maker? Mm. I, I, I mean, I, do you want to go? You, you have a well, I, I'm... <laughs> I mean, I, I choose the new tools because they allow me to do things that I couldn't do with a bag of clay on a wheel. So and for me, it's about sort of narrative and storytelling. The other tools that I find useful, um, have, all, have found useful since, um, I suppose, the early 90s, were things like you know, just being able to create a website to promote my activities. You know, you used to have to send packs of slides mm. off to curators and... Um, to, to you know, shops and galleries, and you'd never get them back. It was always a battle. So, um, you know, so so they're very. There's lots of very very practical 
uh, uses that allow you to engage with not just a local marketplace but a, but a, a worldwide marketplace. So yeah, yes, it does make things easier. James, do you want to? Um, well, I, um, yeah, I think it does make things easier in terms of distribution and, and marketing, but not in terms of necessarily actually making stuff. Um, we, I, three folks, we don't, we don't really see the, uh, that adoption of, uh, of 3D printers and, and what, what have you. Um, mainly because I think that's still very early days, it's still mm -hmm. in the geocities of things and, and, and the understanding of what these things can do and to some extent the cost of actually buying them um, is, still, is, is, is still out of reach of quite a lot of people. Um, so yeah, I'd, I kind of think that the technology at the moment is still being used for um, kind of you know, distribution and, um, and marketing. Mm. Yeah, need? definitely. I mean, let's not forget that there has already been a massively established industry around people making things. It's not mm. like the, the, the product space that we're sort of finding ourselves in now is anything new. Um, there have always been companies making huge quantities of things um, that enable us to live the way that we do. I mean, it's, it's not like we would have to... Like for something as simple as a chair, we would have to go, okay, which chair do I want to download that? Okay, going to wait three weeks for the specific factory around the corner or the, the making facility to turn that out for us. We just go to the shop and we buy a chair. And I think that people would be very annoyed if that system went away. And people can exist being makers. They're just called designers and prototypers and industrial engineers. And so I think there's... There is, a, there is a parallel world that tends to be overlooked because it's seen as big and scary, but actually it achieves so much for what we expect from life at the moment. Mm. But in, you know, this industrial revolution allows me to sit up near a candle surrounded by sheep, you know, working away on my computer, taking the dog out for a walk across the fields occasionally, and then sending the data down to the, the, the bureau in London, in this case, or in Limoges, as it, as it used to be, and having my work manufactured. Yeah, yeah. You know, so it's, yeah, it, it frees me to yeah. live in an yeah. environment of choice. Yeah. Yeah, that, 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 the, the freedom of information in that respect, I think, is really powerful. Like a lot of the, some of the kind of more niche services that spring up where you can send CAD designs off to a company halfway across the world and get, and get that thing made and sent back to you. Um, or you can use Etsy's alchemy service to, you know, kind of say, actually, could I have a, that, that kind of jumper that I've seen down the high street, but can I have it in mohair wool and with a, I don't know, kind of turquoise, turquoise kind of like ribbon around it. Um, you, you know, you can, you can ask for things and you can do things with information which facilitate people making things more easily. Um, but but the physical thing itself is still, I think, wrapped in, wrapped in things that are hard to do. Definitely, and I don't think that's going to change, really. In that, in that um, we, have, we have new... We all can go to Shapeways or these various websites and, and submit a, a design, um, but you've still got to either learn the software or you know, work with somebody. You've still got to develop um, some sort of sensibility to the production of, of, a, of an object, haven't you? Mm. So it still requires skills and learning in the same way as, you know, wielding a hammer mm. or, you know, yeah, whittling voxels or pixels you know, is much the same as whittling a stick. Mm. Yeah. Well, with that in mind, um, one thing I, I wanted to ask about... Um, that issue of skills and learning and, and uh, sensibility, I think you said, Michael. Um, with the rise of, of obviously online communities and, and I think particularly a culture of tutorials through blogs and things like Instructables, um, I wondered what you thought about, is it possible that anyone can learn anything and, and do you think that's a good thing? Who, who's got any thoughts on that? I think it's dreadful that people can learn stuff. <laughs> no, I've got, I mean, of course it's brilliant that um, that that stuff is available um, and you can explore. I mean, I spend, like, I've learned more from those systems than I ever did at, at school, I think, probably. Um, it's, it's an amazing resource and, yeah, I think it's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, I think, I think it's, it's what we found with, with folks is that um, over four years or so, three, three years it's been living, is that um, 
a lot of people who started out actually not being particularly good at making things have progressed and become actually semi-professional or actually starting to make a living from something. So they're, they're, they've learned to be, to be much better. And I think a lot of that comes from the fact that they, they, they see other people and they aspire to be as good and they learn from other people, mm. um, which I think is uh, you know, a, a very good thing. Um, but there's still quite a lot of elitism, I think, around craft and around the, you know, the sense of being a professional craft or a professional maker of something. Um, and, and we see a lot of um, we see a lot of people kind of reluctant to sell on marketplaces mainly because they, they don't want to be seen with the hobbyists and the, the amateurs, and they don't want their work to be associated or to be um, to sit with those those sort of pieces of work, even though they might be you know, their low cost kind of items. So the stuff they might make in the studio that they can knock out for twenty quid a pit, twenty quid a pop. Um, they're still reluctant to see that. They want to keep that rarefied kind of fortress of the gallery um, as, as, as protecting their, their sense, their status, <laughs> in a way. I was, I was thinking about evening classes. You know, I used to teach evening classes uh, at Kendall College years and years ago. And it, it was a wonderful resource for the, for the community, either you know, to learn a skill, to meet socially. Mm. It was an acceptable place. This was in the, I don't know, early 80s. It was an acceptable place for, for um, you, mother, young mothers particularly to meet rather than going to the pub, which wasn't all that acceptable in Kendall. It was a bit rough in the evenings. Um, so pottery evening classes were a great place where you could, you could learn a skill, you could have a chat, you, know, you could talk about your children or talk about your holiday or whatever. Um, and I'm just wondering, James, whether these are there, is there, is there that spin-off coming from, from, uh, things, you know, from projects like yours, your folks? Are makers actually meeting up? And yeah, yeah, they are, very much so. But, but actually, I think what I was, to go back to my previous point, they're, they're meeting up socially, but they're not meeting up to do things together. Mm. Um, so the, the disciplines of craft still seem quite separate. Mm. Um, yeah, which, which is kind of odd. What are they meeting up to do? Oh, just chit chat. Okay. In many ways, they're not meeting to do things together, though. Well, they, they, sometimes so. They, so the, you know, there's a big group in Sheffield called Sheffield Craft Candy, um, who meets. Uh, it's mainly social, but they also organise kind of events and. Um, and they make things often whilst they're there. But the, the primary reason for meeting up is, is because they want to just have, they have a shared interest in making things and they want to meet other people with that shared interest. Mm. Um, and that's happening. There's got folksy groups, you know, all over the country kind of just doing that informally, um, meeting up, which is... And do they share techniques when they meet or...? Yeah. Uh, more techniques around, again, how, how to be better at selling things or how right. to be better at photographing things, which is so important on, on the internet. You know how you represent your your thing, um, less so about the making of, of what whatever it is you're making. Because that's that's one thing in, in sort of communities of tinkerers and hackers, and let's not get into a debate about what those terms could actually mean. Um, but when they get together, like we often just it's it's all about the technicalities of mm. achieving certain things. Mm. Um, I've yet to go to any meetings which have thought. Um, around well, what what would be the implications in in a in a space to create this kind of product? What should be the what would be the best way of approaching the user interface around this? What what are the what, what's the story behind the device? Where does it sit alongside other things that? Um, so a lot of the sort of higher level discussions don't seem to happen, and it's not it's not the purpose of those groups really. It's purely there's so much stuff already to learn to get up to a point. Mm to where you can then begin to explore some of those areas. Mm. Um, and also, it's not quite necessarily what the reward is. If you're not selling something, what is the reward for doing it? You know, is it is reward just purely from making it something? Um, or have you, you know, do you want to, you know, do you want to get to the stage where you can become self-sufficient and, and you know, fund your life through, this, through making stuff? But then is it possible that actually the craft nature in, say, programming is making those changes that to code that nobody else will notice mm. but just actually make it better in your eyes mm. so isn't that we are we are our course. own worst critics aren't we mm. you know we are we are the you know if we're not our own worst critics then then there's not much point in carrying on i don't think really one of the things that, that you were just saying there made me think about um I suppose one of, one of the differences really between digital development and, and handmade development and actually that is very much that digital development in the world that you work in, James, very much kind of rolls on user testing and, and kind of minor tweaks and iterations on an ongoing basis. 
Um, I don't know that I've ever come across anyone who would use the web to do that with their craft production, but is that anything anybody, has anybody else kind of seen where somebody may have, have used the internet to invite critiques of their work and modify it on that basis in the same way? Um, I haven't really seen that. What I've found is actually the, the, uh, the, the people that, that sell with folks here aren't necessarily very good at getting feedback. Um, at receiving feedback. <laughs> they're not um, very good at inviting it or they're not very good at receiving well, it? <laughs> they, they say they want it, but they're not necessarily very good at, at, at taking it. Um, and, and often when they're not selling stuff, they'll, they'll be critical of, of the platform or the marketplace or whatever and won't necessarily look at the fact that what they're selling is, you know, another knitted um, bit of fruit, which... Um, Jesus, I've got a Gerald rat in a moment here. <laughs> <laughs> But that, you know, that sense of, um, that, you know, that, that sense of, of, of not, not necessarily being critical of their own work um, is something I've noticed. Um, and I think it comes out of the fact that, you know, they don't necessarily know what else to do. They've, mm. you know, they, they've seen other people sell that stuff or similar stuff. They think their stuff is at least as good. Why, doesn't it, why, isn't, why isn't it as successful? Is, is there an issue that the internet generates trends and people are kind of unable, I suppose, as Michael would do, to go back to source material and start mm. absolutely from scratch. Is, is that a, a difficulty that's generated by the internet? I, su I suppose in the area that I'm most um, closely aware of and, and involved in, um, the, the emphasis has been much more on the engineering, I suppose, rather than aesthetics. Mm. So the, sort of the quite, although it's in its infancy, the sort of open source hardware movement where Yes, whole projects have grown out of community development in the same way that in open source software they do. Um, but the emphasis is generally on productivity and, and making a device the most appropriate for a particular solution rather than the most beautiful device or something which is used as a vehicle for self-expression. Um, mm. And that's where I guess it can become difficult because you're dealing with um, personalities on a much more, uh, a much more immediate level. Um, and, in, and in decisions that can't always be justified. <laughs> yeah. But I think, I think actually one of the things we're keen to do is actually just to, to incorporate comment, comments on, on, say, product pages and stuff like that as a way to solicit feedback from people. Um, and there's been some reference when we've tested that, as Gorilla tested that. Um, but th 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 this thought that you can, that a platform such as Folks or Etsy or one of the others can be a, f can be a form for, say, many of the 4,000 or so applied artists that come out of design schools and art schools every year to, to, to test an idea and test a concept um, and get feedback on it and iterate, you know, iterate from a small thing to something that's better um, and, and do that quite quickly is something that I'm, I'm fascinated and I'm, uh, you know, that should, that should be very, mm. but it should apply to, the benefit, you know, to, to what the web's good at, right? Mm. Mm. Do you know much about the, the visitors to Folksy? Like yeah. numbers and so know, we get what, what their interests are, and do you get any any feedback? Well, in the sense of I know the I know the metrics. So we, you know, there's uh, half a million people visit every month. There's five and a half million page impressions, and there's five and a half thousand people actively selling stuff. Wow. Um, so it's you know it's it's reasonably big. It's nowhere near the scale of Etsy, which is global, and we're just UK based. Um, but uh, what? And, and, and what we do do is we tend to, to do testing when we're doing development on the site. Um, but that tends to be with tends to be because we're based in Sheffield with a, a group of people who live in Sheffield. Mm. Um, and the feedback we get is just through the support system. So we have one person who's full time support, pretty much who who just deals with support, and we we feed that into the weekly meetings that we get. Um, yeah. That answer? That, is there yeah, no, specifically? Yeah. Well, no, what I was, what I was sort of think, what was going on in my mind was um, going back to, to this. The reason I chose that image of, that we all have innate creativity, and it's expressed uh, either by making or gardening or climbing mountains, or if we can't do that, then the purchase of handmade objects, of exquisite objects, you're sort of buying into something that strikes a deep. Mm chord that resonates to something that's extremely fundamental in, in, in the human psyche. Yeah, I think so. Well, there's two things, I think. One is personalisation, so you get, you, you're getting kind of unique objects, and I think uh, that's, that's definitely a, a factor, mm. you know, seeing something that's very different. So, and, and, and I think this market, this is what's, what strikes me as very interesting about this market, is they can, that those, those, that slice of, of sellers who are very um, proactive 
and are very interesting, can be very quick to get something out into market. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like the, the Nifty Nits, who's a show the Meerkats, you know, if something comes out on TV or something else, you know, there's a new Meerkat, Meerkat, so it's always particularly wedding. innovative. But yeah, you know, so the, 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 she, she will innovate and get something out there quite quickly and, and, and many of us do the same kind of thing. So there's that sense of being quite, you know, quite quick to market, mm. far quicker than, you know, mm. Zara who do things, what is it, two weeks? People talk about this, the, the sorry, it's very quick to market in terms of two weeks, but our sales can be two days. And that's fascinating, I think it's fascinating. So that's where it pushes up against the scale issue again. Yeah. But. I think there's, there's inherent, inherent tension in craft yeah, and scale, yeah. like you mentioned. I think, you, you know, you, it's something, as soon as you start to use industrial processes and, and move out beyond a, maybe small batch production into something that's bigger and you go into Alibaba and, and kind of going, oh yeah, I'll, I'll, that Chinese manufacturer can whack out 10,000 of these, thank you very much. Then it's a very different, you know, it's a, mm. it's a different thing, it's not craft yeah. anymore. Yeah. Mm. Or is it? <laughs> is it design? Is there, yeah. is there a, when we're talking about that scale and that tension, is, is there a difference between the way your works and, and uses digital technologies and the internet to help facilitate what you do? Because that, that seems to me very different from the kind of the nifty nits on Folksy and again from what Michael does. What's, how does your work borrow from that? Um, I suppose the biggest difference is that at the moment I don't actually sell anything. Um, so I don't use the internet for selling. Um, but yeah, I, I, th I think yes, um, it probably does uh, affect. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a learning tool. It's the, it's, it's, again, it's that primarily it's that communication and research side of things. Mm. Um, and there are just the, the stuff that I can do now that, although the technology itself is not new, none of the stuff that I use is really much, well, some of the microcontrollers are 20 years old, but so it's quite old technology, but it's just now that it's become available and packaged in a form that somebody who had no sort of formal training in maths or physics or anything like that can come to it and begin to hack and play around and see things as a result of just bloody-minded testing, um, which I suppose is probably closer to the affordances of traditional craft objects that you have mm. to understand how to chop a bit of wood, yeah. how to turn a bowl. Mm. It's, you, you don't just learn that from looking at it, but you learn it from trying and mm. splitting wood and blowing chips and burning your hands. Mm -hmm. kind of, there's, there's something now that the, that the raw materials are such where although the environmental cost is high, um, the, the purchasing cost for the general public has come down such that it's possible to explore that as a material. What, what I find particularly interesting about that kind of um, the, the, the move into hardware in the last few years is, is, is how that kind of software, the software community, the, the kind of software engineering kind of community, if you like, of, I, I just love the fact that they're actually doing stuff with their hands and, and making stuff. Um, so Rob, who's at Rattle, is a software engineer, but he also kind of loves just, and, and Frankie, just love uh, getting, you know, getting the toolboxes out and, and starting to, you know, make stuff. And, and seeing that, seeing what, you know, what would otherwise be, you know, a, a script or just a bit, a bit of something on the screen actually come to life as, as, as something material. Mm. Um, and I think that's, that's potentially very powerful, I think. I think that's, that's one of the weird things about terms like post-digital and possibly post-craft is that it's, it's almost perverse because mm. it's like, of course it makes sense. You're making stuff with your hands. You're, yeah. You've actually mm. achieved something physical that exists in the world, but we've probably got half a generation of people who have spent too much time. Like I spent most of my youth in front of a screen not doing that much, except yeah. when I was playing music. And so mm. it's, yeah, it's, it is it is perverse, but perversely appropriate. Mm. I think there's a strange thing there. So should we be encouraging schools, education systems to, to embrace all this making? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, I applaud organisations like the Crafts Council mm. that uh, have got the firing up uh, scheme, something very close to my heart. You know, trying mm. to reintroduce in, ceramics back into, into schools, into the education system. Um, it seems to be a great success. Does that, you know, kids absolutely love engaging with materials and if you can combine that with the technological uh, tools that, that are out there then you know what's the future it's just so could be so amazing mm. I, th I think I think that's true I think but, but moving but I think they need to be able to see that there's, there's a, a career in that path whereas I don't I don't know 
But it's not just a career, it's about problem solving, it's about a way of thinking. And, uh, and for me, that, that approach um, develops skills that can be applied in all walks of life. Mm. Yeah, you know? So it's not just the fact that you know, they're going to go out and be, be a potter, there's probably a limited yeah. number of potters required in the world, but yeah. it's an approach, it's a way... Yeah. Michael Crawford, is it Matthew Crawford talks about yes, that yeah. in, in this book, which is br utterly brilliant. Mm. About John the Ruskin has a few things to say about it as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yes. Okay, I think we've probably got just over ten minutes left, so I wondered if anybody has any questions that they'd like to put to any of the panel. I think there's a roving mic somewhere. Uh, there's a question right over there. Hello, um, my name's Kevin Hoyle, and uh, I'm a maker. And um, I'm interested to know whether product design, sort of physical products, ceramics, and so on, um, especially with digital prototyping techniques, whether things like open source are likely to happen, whether you think there's a role for that in product design, where people are saying, I've invented this or I've created this, but actually you can make one too. It's not something that just simply belongs to me. Are you engaged in that? Do you think it makes sense? Uh, at the moment, for example, I'm uh, working with somebody who's um, working on a ceramics project which combines electronics. And so it seems sort of a natural thing to suggest to her, but is it a good idea? And um, it depends um, what the push of the project is, really. I mean, it, you do raise all of the questions about, as James pointed out, all the questions about IP. Um, there's a lot of lot of things to consider in terms of the ownership and also just the scale that you're looking to operate on. I think it is. Um, there's a lot of space for really very practical things to be done with open source hardware um, and for being able to get stuff fabbed up locally. Um, but I think it's 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 a tricky thing. It's gonna it's gonna start with the frivolous and the and the decorative. Um, not that decorative things are frivolous, but it's going to, just to put in very general hierarchies, it's like I would be quite happy to have a custom, um, a custom bauble or a, a, a custom picture frame that somebody has helped me design. I don't want a custom washing machine um, or necessarily a bit for my car. Um, although you could, you could now go down to a machine shop and get someone to cut you out a bolt that would fit. It's, there is, there's, it's probably in that space, seeing where there are already local manufacturers who could perhaps get into open source hardware as well, and just product specs. I mean, these people work off very tight specification documents. If open source hardware uh, movements create specification documents that can then be given to someone to turn out trusted, reliable parts for things, um, I think there's, like, that's achievable now. Yeah, I think. In, in the same way that kind of GitHub and, and places like that are, are repositories for, for code and, and your, the, your use of that and your value to that community is based on giving back into that. There's, there's a site called Ravelry in the States which basically does the same with knitting patterns and it's colossally popular, it's massively popular. Um, and, and some people decide to give them away and some people decide that they want to charge for those patterns. But ultimately, the, kind of, for them, it's, it's kind of peer recognition and stuff, and it's, uh, for me, that's, it's, it's, I, I was amazed, gobsmacked, that this went from being a very niche thing to being um, in, in as bigger than the marketplaces that, that people were using to sell their stuff. Um, so yeah, I think, for me, that the model of, of selling patterns and schematics and stuff, or giving them away, uh, it seems a logical step. Mm -hmm. If only for that peer recognition and, and this, you know, the community kind of recognition you get. So professionally, it could make sense. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Well, as, as a potter, I publish all the glaze recipes that we've developed o over the years. And you know, our attitude was that, um, well, the, the ceramics community is, is a very generous community because we all work with particular materials in particular studios. There's different, sort of, um, you know, we all have different equipment. Uh, so if I publish it, if somebody, if, if you take my glaze recipe, when you make up those materials and put them on your pots and put them in your kiln, they're going to behave slightly differently. So they're only ever a starting point. Mm -hmm. And, and the, 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 the way that, that we think is that um, it, it's fine to take a glaze recipe 
Um, but build on it. Take it, don't just steal it, but take it and run mm -hmm. with it and make it your own. Take it, leapfrog the, the information. Take it forward and, and grow it and then put it back into the domain of the, the public domain and let somebody else well, then, go on you, from there. Presumably you want attribution for that? You want kind of some version control, say, Martin, um, Michael? With the glaze recipe, I'm not bothered. Okay. No, I'm not bothered at all. Um, however, with you know, my um, 3D printed selective laser sintered work, mm. um, I'd be hesitant of you know, just handing the data over at the moment. Um, but if somebody got hold of the data, then I'd think it was a bit sad, really, um, that, you know, well, why don't you do it yourself? You know, mm. what, would you, what would they do with it? So, okay, they could print one of my pieces, but, but what was, what's the point of that? Mm. So... I'm, I'm keen on getting information out there and allowing people to take it and run with it. Okay. okay. Um, have we got any more questions? <coughs> Hello. Uh, that's just the panel. Could you talk about craft? And it was interesting to know what your thoughts were about the difference between at a point when a craft maybe becomes a trade. Because the, the, you were talking before about it seems that when you become a professional, as you mentioned about mm. being a professional craftsperson, you've acquired these skills. But I was saying, where do you... I know I have, I have my opinions on this, but where do you feel that, that difference between craft becomes trade? So if you're, if you're skilled in something, for instance, because in my previous hat before digital, where I am now, I was brought up in a family business, I'm a cabinet maker, so I'm a professional. Mm. And yet I went into craft... But I've, I kind of see this kind of romanticism about the word craft, and I'm wondering if really you're actually tradespeople. So I just want to kind mm -hmm. of, on that spectrum of that, do you understand that question? What, mm -hmm. what do you, what's your thoughts on that? About does a craft eventually become a trade, and does that pass and answer the question of post craft? I mean, is it kind of going on all the time? Are you crafty for a bit, and then you eventually become a tradesperson? James, what do you want you? to start well, with, I, it with your yeah, first I, folksy I, head I, on? I, Personally, I believe that it, it kind of trades are of kind of just formalised crafts and institutions and rules, and and uh, and they look to protect, you know, the nature of uh, the, the interests of a particular group of people, rather than necessarily look to protect the the, the interests of a practice. I would say. Um, so you know, um, on on folks, we have a number of professional, so-called professional sellers who who are accredited by the Crafts Council or whatever, but they're, they're in a very small minority. Um, and they, the, the majority of those, the people who won't come to us because they, are, they seem to be quite professional, um, hold on to, the, to, the, to their accreditation in certain bodies and see perhaps that as a trade. They don't want to, to great, go with the great and washed of just people who are often very, very um, talented craftspeople, but on. You know, Self-taught or the kind of peer-taught. Yeah, or, or, or actually, they've 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 got a, a degree in applied arts or whatever, but for whatever reason, they've never sought to do that professionally or sought to earn money from it, and they're not accredited by a body. Um, so that, you know, they don't, you know, they they, they may be incredibly skilled, but they, they're not. Mm. I, I guess I, I see accreditation correlating with being a tradesperson. Mm. I think we're going to a sort of grey area of se semantics here. It, it, there's, there's overlap. I don't think there's any, any clear boundaries between, you know, between all these words, trade, craft, design, artist. You know, there's, a, there's, yeah, there's no clearly defined boundaries. I think if Matthew Crawford was here, he would probably relate the story of the electrician that's, uh, whose work he came across in a, a fairly inaccessible part of a, a building where the conduit, all this, all this wiring, was absolutely immaculate, but nobody would see it. So, you know, was the electrician who created this, was he a tradesman, was he a craftsman? He was taking enormous pleasure in doing this job for, his, for its own sake. So, to me, he was a trades, tradesman who was a craftsman, or, yeah. I don't know whether, that, does that answer, or help yeah, to answer just, the question? I was interested in that mm. kind of way, because it seemed like there was, a, there was a numbers thing as well, because I used to do bespoke furniture, which was one of us. Mm. So, was, there was no sort of production numbers mm. so it's, it's like it's kind of about numbers and yeah because mm -hmm. yeah, you know there's limited editions sure. you know, so i think we've probably got time for two quick questions or one yeah, one, more, one quick question yes there's one just 
behind the pillar, between the pillars. Hi there, um, I'm Natasha, a PhD student from Lancaster University. I guess I could break this question into two if you like. Um, it's directed mostly at James and Andy. Um, I'm interested in kind of how we can commercialize these new production approaches. Um, and I look at the marketplace approach of something like Foxy, um, and I question that because the filtering techniques are actually not, not directly um, at Foxy, but other platforms are not actually that good. Um, so you get a lot of noise in the market. Um, and to Andy, I'm wondering about the kind of the spectacle of creation. I'm aware of some of your work, and I wonder about selling participation in um, designing and production, perhaps, as being the way of scaling this up to a commercial approach. So just what are your thoughts on that? Can I, can I just make a suggestion? In the interest of time, could we do Andy's first and then come back to James if we've got time and if we haven't? James, I'm not as important. possibly. No, I, what I'm going to say is then you'll have more time to talk to him separately outside the session yeah. and you don't have to rush your answer. Yeah, totally. Is that, is that okay? So the, the main question was about the spectacle and kind of collaboration in design. Yeah, I think there's, there's, there's space for that in certain types of products. Um, again, it's probably down to the, the, on the level of making bespoke furniture, on the level of making um, kits or toolkits of certain products. I mean, on a very grand scale, that's what, that's what Apple do um, very didactically, but they've made you a set of tools that you can go and use in certain capacities in different areas of your life and other, other technology companies do that um, and they do that spectacularly. Um, but I see, uh, as you see what you're saying, actually, well, what, what would you mean by the spectacle in production? So you're kind of talking about buying in as an audience member to that process of participating. I'm, yeah. I'm sure that there will be, people will do that more and more, um, but it's going to be quite a, I think probably the thing is it's quite an expensive process. Um, and that's, that's a difficult thing because like I could, the, one of the tensions that I feel is that um, I could make things like the tap tap boxes, um, but actually, I don't want to make those at a level where they cost £150 each. Mm. Um, and uh, I'd, I'd much rather create something that people could buy more readily. And I think the same would be true of things like, things like chocolate. People like chocolate for how it tastes. Um, not necessarily because it looks like a swan or a unicorn with laser eyes. Um, that kind of thing. Great, thank you very much. And do catch James later. I only kind of moved you on to the second half because I know it's potentially a long answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Cool, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.